The views expressed in this podcast do not reflect those of our training institutions or the APA. The information discussed is for educational purposes only and should not be used for diagnosis or treatment. Enjoy! Today, we have myself, Barrington Huang, one of the media editors, and Matthew Edwards, the outgoing editor-in-chief of the AJP Residence Journal. Hey, Barrington. Glad to be here. We will discuss some reflections Matthew has had over the past year. We will talk about skills that he learned while serving during his three-year stint with the editorial board, some of Matthew's scholarly work including discussing Freedom House, his reasons for pursuing forensic psychiatry fellowship, and more. He's wrapping up this academic year with the board his last year and will be listed under the Editors Emeriti. Now you've been uh, editor-in-chief for the past year and had three years of experience with the Residence Journal. What did you learn and would you do it again? Good question, Barrington. Um, so I've actually been on the board for about three years now. I started as a deputy editor for my first year. My second year, I was a senior deputy editor. And then um, uh, finally, that role culminated in being editor-in-chief. Um, and each year, I've learned something new and different. I've gotten to interface and interact with people in different ways. and each has posed its own unique challenges and opportunities. I think um, I would certainly do it again. Uh, and, I, and it's hard to say which year I've enjoyed the most. They're all very different and all equally rewarding in their own ways. Yeah, that's really neat to hear. I think there's a lot of skills that we can really develop in this these roles. What skills did you develop specifically when you were being an editor? You know, a number of skills, I think, stand out to me. The Residence Journal can provide a really unique opportunity to take on a new role or identity. You know, whether that's working in social media, uh, working as a reviewer, working as an author, or just developing an expertise in something. Um, it really provides a forum and an opportunity to really try something on in both a way that's relatively lower stakes than at later stages in your career, yet also really meaningful. Um, and that gives you a really meaningful and important platform, I think, to advance your work and ideas and skills and expertise. It can also help you, you know, gain some visibility on your work and that can create further opportunities as you progress, you know, during your residency career. I think it's really important that it's not just one, like you're only doing one thing. I mean, you can you can think about learning from different angles of this, and it's not this you know, 100% defined role. I mean, you have these specific roles, but you don't really, uh, you're not defined to that for you know, the rest of your career, and you can use this as a, a great learning opportunity. Right, and oh, yeah, I think it also gives you an opportunity to see how the quote-unquote sausage is made. Um, you know, so we spend a significant part of our lives reading articles and book chapters and um, other types of literature, you know, from undergraduate um, education to undergraduate medical education throughout residency. And learning how to critically appraise and evaluate work, learning how to read, coming up with a systematic way to really get the essential um, aspects of, of, of an article or an argument or research is, is really important. In some ways, the Residence Journal has allowed me to sort of see from sort of every angle, both, you know, from coming up with an idea and, you know, proposing a topic all the way to seeing it in print and to sort of see all the work that goes, you know, into that. But more importantly, all of the people and players um, that help make that what it is, you know. And so I, I think we often think that, you know, someone comes up with an idea and they execute it alone and they submit it for publication and then it's, you know, this final product. But there are a number of mentors and, I, you know, people that we bounce our ideas off of and there's multiple stages of feedback and um, lots of revision that really kind of go into that. And, you know, that's just on the submission review side, you know, you know, there's a, there's an entire staff of you know, staff editors and, you know, like yourself, um, you know, media specialists who also help uh, make those products really refined um, and then present them in a way the public can access them. Uh, and, 
you know, it, it also has provided an opportunity to really think about new medias um, and ways to reach people in different ways. And so um, whether that's, you know, Instagram or Facebook or uh, Twitter, um, these are all new and, uh, you know, engaging uh, technologies, you know, that, that weren't as popular among academic circles, um, you know, about you know, 10 years ago. Any articles that you've published recently that you've really enjoyed, you know, writing or editing and, and thinking about? Yeah, um, I've spent um, the past couple of years um, doing a historical research, specifically on a program um, called the Freedom House Ambulance Service. And the Freedom House Ambulance Service was a novel sociomedical program in the 1960s and 70s that helped set national standards for emergency medical care and particularly unique or, or special. This, this program was an entirely black run program um, that sought to encourage black enterprise um, and so recruited men and women um, from particularly marginalized um, um, sex of society. They went on to uh, demonstrate national standards that we still benefit from today. The program unfortunately succumbed to um, racial politics and antagonism, funding difficulties, um, and the sort of changing um, spirit of the times. But nonetheless, despite all of this, still um, did remarkable work. And so I've been looking at this um, history from the perspective of the paramedics, founders, um, and kind of how it's been influential in the history of medicine. And I've had the opportunity to present this um, research in a number of uh, different sort of spaces as a speaker in various um, colleges and universities, um, as well as publications. Um, The long form article um, appeared in the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences and a more recent perspective article in the New England Journal um, titled Race, Policing and History, Remembering the Freedom House Ambulance Service. It's been really fun uh, to share this work with people um, and to see the reception and even more fun to learn from and speak with some of the pioneers who, who lived it um, and people who were around uh, when this history took, took place. You know, and often we think of history as removed from the present, but as people read this article and you know, things that seem quite distant you know, to me, you know, I don't re- really remember what a paddy wagon was or, or you know, morticians providing ambulance care, but many people still around today do remember those uh, times. And so uh, it's been, you know, kind of really cool as a historian to meet people who remember those times as more than just, you know, a story, but as, as their reality. Thanks for, you know, sharing all your thoughts. And I know uh, after this resident journal's position uh, and coinciding with inner residency, you're starting up forensics fellowship pretty soon, you know, what, what made you want to do that? Yeah. Um, so I didn't think I would go into forensics when I started residency and I now regret not doing the elective opportunity as a medical student, Uh, but I was so sure that I wasn't going to do forensics as a subspecialty career that I didn't even think about, uh, learning about it in medical school, which was a real missed opportunity. I don't have to tell you this, um, or any, Um, other psychiatrists out there, but, you know, as a psychiatrist in training, you're thrust into forensics and the legal setting and and ethical questions, you know, really from day one. I remember my first week of residency, you know, on the inpatient units, you know, with, I think on my second day, I had, you know, court hearings, in hospital administrative court hearings. And the fact that that's such an important important and prominent role in our work um, and that it happened so early and that it becomes such a regular part um, of our jobs is really fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Learning about the law, which doesn't always come easily for many, also provided you know new learning opportunities. Uh, it was kind of an exciting challenge. I think also learning to appreciate the law in context. What is it that the law provides? Why does it provide that? And how does history, social context and social systems, our political values, and our understanding of ethics and ethical principles all guide the law as 
you know, we see it as, as it's implemented, as it's practiced, and as it's understood. Those are all really fascinating things to me. And as a historian, I've come to appreciate the history of forensics, um, you know, and what it, what it means for the specialty. So a number of historians have argued that it was actually forensic psychiatry that helped give psychiatry a public facing role, you know, and it marked psychiatry's uh, quote unquote coming of age. You know, it legitimized psychiatrists, you know, role and purview of detecting, determining and opining on sanity versus insanity, you know, true accounts of illness versus malingering or secondary gain. Um, and in that way, it's really one of the oldest aspects or specialties within psychiatry. Yet many people aren't really aware that it's, you know, that it plays such a large role in, in the work that we do. And then early on in residency, I had an opportunity to, you know, testify in court, um, learning how to craft an argument, a coherent argument, and being subject that argument being subject to cross-examination was an interesting and challenging and exciting and at times, a, you know, kind of scary um, experience. Um, but uh, it's one that's been uh, really, really uh, rewarding and memorable for me. Uh, and it's one that I've uh, really enjoyed uh, doing. And I think lastly, you know, as I've, you know, progressed through residency these past four years, I've really learned that many of our patients have interfaced, are currently interfacing, or will interface with the carceral and criminal justice systems and, and the disability system. And so it's important for psychiatrists, and indeed it's incumbent on us, uh, to understand um, these systems uh, uh, and phenomena and how to uh, best navigate them. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I feel like you know, people think about the involuntary commitment, whatever state you're in, it's it's different. But it always it's always a weird conversation, especially like you said, second day of residency, and you're like thrust in this role. But thanks for sharing that. Any other last thoughts? Yeah, and or, uh, kind of you know, as you say that, I it, uh, it reminds me of my own uh, experiences here in California. So uh, you know, it was California that played a, a large role in deinstitutionalization. Um, you know, it was uh, Governor Reagan um, who, you know, helped put into motion the, you know, kind of processes uh, that, that supported the, you know, Community Mental Health Centers Act and closing down a number of state institutions. Um, and it was, you know, the uh, LPS Act um, uh, here that, you know, really helped set the standard and became a model for other states similar laws and processes. So it's been quite an interesting experience to practice in the state where in many ways, a lot of those movements and ideas and um, systems um, evolved. Yeah, so you mentioned in your earlier answer, you mentioned some of the camaraderie. Can you talk a little more about that and what it looks like for you? Yeah, so that's been, I I really enjoy the work of editing. Um, And this was not my first experience as an editor. Um, I had previously worked um, as a special guest issue editor or theme issue editor for the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics. And so editing, reviewing, um, writing, uh, research has always been an interest of mine. And uh, in many ways, this editing experience was quite different because I worked more closely with peers um, and folks along sort of the same sort of level of training as myself, Um, you know, Earlier on, uh, most of my, uh, you know, the editor in chief and and the senior deputy editor were were folks who are more senior to me, uh, and and now I work with a number of folks who are more junior to me, and it's allowed me to really make a lot of friendships, to learn a lot from different folks, um, to see the number of perspectives that people come with, whether they're you know um, lawyers, you know bench researchers, clinical researchers, media specialists extraordinaire, you know, um, you know, attorneys, it it really, uh, activists, it it really just uh, kind of continues to blow my mind, you know, the number of, you know, diverse perspectives that go into psychiatry, and how in many ways, what we're able to accomplish um, as psychiatrists, you know, as researchers, as as authors, um, sort of 
um, depends on that sort of diversity of thought. On the other end of that, it's it's really cool to be able to see a number of the authors, you know, editors, uh, people who listen uh, at various events, um, forums a- across the country. Pre-COVID, we got to go to, you know, the APA annual meeting, um, you, you know, and I got to go to, you know, I'm a member of the Group for the Advancement of Psych- Psychiatry, I uh, was a GAP fellow, and, you know, I got to meet folks from across the country there, many of whom read the journal and, you know, other meetings and, and organizations. And so it's it's really helped make um, psychiatry seem a lot smaller. Um, and you really see how close-knit and interconnected we are. And I think within our own residency programs and our regions, our states, our coasts, um, we can often become really siloed. Um, and so the Residence Journal has really allowed me to stay connected with people across the across the country. Um, and, it, and that's been really rewarding. Um, and, and, and more than anything, you, you develop both a professional relationship with people, but also you make friends. Um, and uh, in many ways, that's been uh, the best part. Yeah. Friends are good to have. Yeah. Next year, it's APA is in New Orleans. And so I'm looking forward to going. To oh, that. I hope I get to go too. That'd be really nice. And it's, it'll be closer yeah. to Georgia. I might even get to drive. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing what you all do with it, you know, in Austin and yeah. uh, the other folks. Well, I'm a lot of fun. I think, uh, I don't know, I just like talking with people, hearing their stories, seeing uh, what's out there. I guess it's, you know, it's also kind of like maybe cool and, and whatever. I mean, for both of us, you know, you come back like 10, 20, 30 years and you look at these publications of various forms and you're like, well, it's cool. I did that. And it's like, memorialized in this semi-formal way and it's kind of like your own study guy but also it's like it represents you know mm-hmm. your early career and it's a, kind of some of the fun time stuff capsule you learning um, yeah a time capsule there's a the editor-in-chief during my first year oliver glass uh recently published an article in the journal of geriatrics american journal of geriatric psychiatry he wrote an article recently about his grandfather who escaped the Holocaust and the ghettos into the Soviet Union. Oh, wow. And he found a recording of his grandfather describing that experience. And he like talks about how he listens to it and oh. how he gets emotional. It's yeah. really interesting how I'm, I'm pretty sure his grandfather didn't think at any moment like that that would be, that it'd probably have as, an emo- as big an emotional impact on Oliver as, as it did, but, you know, huh. he was probably, you know, just telling his story and, you know, in his own way. And in many ways, it probably was a, you know, an activity that he was, you know, doing to, so that that history wasn't lost. Um, you know, how, how, however unfortunate, it, you know, it was, um, yet it's been really clearly influential and important um, for Oliver. The, the article is titled, um, Resilience through the Holocaust and Soviet labor camps. Uh, my grandfather, Henry Glass, April 27th, 2021, the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. Oh, yeah. Got it right here. I'll send it to you. Cool. Well, oh, yeah. you, uh, you've been working hard. Cool. Well, enjoy. Be safe. Yeah. I will talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you soon. <laughs>